Hello, everybody. My name is Cody Spurlock, and today I'm joined by a special guest, Mr. Curtis Nightingale. Uh, and on today's episode, we're going to, you know, have a conversation, find out, you know, who Mr. Nightingale is and, uh, uh, you know, what makes him special on this episode of uh, the Spurlock special. So I'm going to go ahead and, and just ask the first question. What makes you special, Mr. Nightingale? Well, I don't know if anything makes me special, Mr. Spurlock. Um, I'm currently the superintendent of schools for uh, Nickerson South Hatch. Uh, been here, this is my third year. Um, I've been in education over 20 years. Um, I've taught in Wichita. I've taught in Newton. I've been a school administrator in Pratt, uh, out north of Salina, and then now here. Uh, prior to education, I'm a retired law enforcement officer, so I spent a career in law enforcement. And um, on the side, I'm a musician, so... I guess I've got, I wear a lot of hats. I don't know if I'm a master of anything, but I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> hey, you, you've been, a, been around the block. So, um, you know, I could ask you questions about being a teacher and even a law enforcement agent, but I think what everybody wants to know is the band. The band. The band. Yeah. How, what's it, what's it uh, like being, being in a band, just in general? Well, you know, I think that's, that's a big question. I would say I, I've been playing in bands since I was in high school. Um, I think I started a band probably my junior year of high school, and I've been playing in bands and recording uh, in studios and stuff ever since. It's taken me some cool places. I've got to play in festivals all over the country. And What kind of uh, music do you play? Uh, rock and heavy metal. Rock and heavy metal. Yep. Are you an instrumental? or I'm a guitar player. Guitar and, player. And I do vocals as well, but uh, my main stay is guitar. So. Well, when did you start playing the guitar? Uh, you know, so I was... Uh, uh, kind of a long story on that, but quite frankly, my dad was a guitar player and he played like oldies rock and he wanted somebody to play with. So he started forcing me to learn how to play, but I really wasn't into <laughs> yeah. it. Um, I was really focused on being a football player and then I got hurt in high school playing football and so I couldn't play anymore. So I kind of ended that for me and I turned that attention then to guitar. And so probably from about 16, 17 years of age to today, um, I've been playing so well, hey, that's you know that's cool. I've uh, I play the clarinet. I know, okay. I know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Talk rock. about heavy metal here. Big rock instrument. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, I've also I've done choir for the past four years yeah. and whatnot. So and I did too. Um, is that you know is that kind of you know I don't know what the word would be uh, weird maybe you know you're you're a superintendent of of schools you you have the you know you're the big boss right and then you also. The first thing I heard about you when, when you were coming to the district was, he has a band. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's interesting. Is yeah. Well, I, I would say it does open some doors for us occasionally because obviously there's a little bit of legitimacy in that. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent, a lot of times in the music world, uh, you know, musicians get the reputation of being flaky that you can't count on them. And so when you come in with a, a career background like I have, I think that adds some legitimacy to my band. And, and that does give us an opportunity maybe to play some places and do some things that we wouldn't have already got to do ordinarily. But uh, I'm currently, I've got three bands, really two that are active. Um, but I play in, in three currently. I've got a, an 80s metal band. We do cover songs like uh, you know, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Metallica, Megadeth, Pantera, that kind of stuff. And then I've got a 90s band, and we do the Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, that kind of stuff. And with that band, we've also recorded our own material and released some albums. And uh, we're streamed on Spotify and Pandora and all of that. And we've got some music videos out. And we had some opportunities to go over to Europe last summer and play in some large festivals in Europe. Um, we weren't able to take advantage of that because the cost of travel yeah. and shipping your equipment is so expensive. And not being a... You know, a signed band, having a record yeah. company backing you, that means you're paying out of pocket for that stuff. And it was like $15,000 a show uh, to travel. Wow. And, and the, band, the band is cool, and I'm definitely interested in it. But you're obviously the superintendent of our schools. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, you, uh, you know, you're in charge of this high school, the middle school, the elementary schools we have, and, and some other facilities and whatnot. Um, you know, what is your favorite part of, of the job? So, you know, becoming a superintendent, probably one of the pieces that I didn't really think through was, you know, when you're a, a teacher and a coach 
even when you become a principal, you still have day-to-day interaction with the students and you get to know the students and you can get to find out things about their lives, kind of like we're doing right here. And, and I didn't really think through that process. When you become a superintendent, you end up stuck down at the district office all day and you really don't have that interaction on a daily basis. I mean, I can come down and see you guys in the hallway and talk to you a little bit, but it's a lot different because you don't deal with me every day. So there's kind of that, who's this guy? And even though you may know I'm the superintendent, you, you don't know if that means I'm approachable. You know, yeah. do you talk to me, not talk to me? That, that kind of, that just by position, it makes you kind of a scary guy or something. And so that's something I really uh, didn't expect or I guess I didn't think through. So I say that only to say that so that's probably not my favorite part of the job is that I don't have that day-to-day interaction yeah. with students and stuff. Um, I would say, though, that the thing I do like about the job that I never had control of before is – I do have the opportunity to really kind of steer the district in in directions that I think things need to go. And so as I look at what we do as a school system and where we want to be and where we want to turn out highly uh, uh, successful students is what we want to do. And what's that look like and what's that mean? Um, You know, and I came out of an era, a generation that you either went to college or yeah, good luck, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. And so um, that was the era I came through. And quite frankly, coming out of high school, I didn't go to college. Um, I went and worked in a mobile home factory is where I started out um, before I got into law enforcement. And that was, a, that was a tough way to live. You know, I went from that. I worked construction for a while. And back in, back in my time, you know, that was a $6 an hour job, yeah. if you can think about that. So imagine getting married and having a kid and you're making $6 an hour. I mean, that was really tough. And so I learned the hard way that there's got to be a better way or a different way um, to make a living. And so that's what propelled me into law enforcement, which then propelled me into going back and and getting a degree, um, getting myself involved in college. And that's not to say that college is the only way to make that happen, but that was my path, right? And so I'm a firm believer in that. And that's kind of my educational philosophy, I guess, if you wanted to try to paint me into a square, is that whole concept of, helping students find the path, whatever the path that looks like, but it needs to be a passionate one. And so, you know, if you have no desire to go to school after high school, if you're just flat done, that's great. We need to help you find a passion, something to plug into that's going to excite you because I can promise you, you know, that old adage of if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That is so true because you find yourself in a job that you hate. You are going to hate Sunday night. Yeah. Because you're thinking about getting up and you got a whole week of going to this place that you hate, right? And so finding something that you're passionate about. And that's why when I got here, the Zello thing became a big push. We were pushing really hard on that um, with that completion matrix. So we ask you guys, get in there, get that done. And you may look at it and think, well, it's a huge waste of my time. I don't want to do that. But really behind the scenes, what you're doing when you're creating those, when you're doing those assessments is it's helping you identify things you really, really would like to do. I've taken that assessment, that matchmaker in Zello, I've taken it a half dozen times probably um, as an adult. I mean, I've, I've taken it probably since I've been here for sure. I've taken it once. And what I can tell you is like, you know, my number one job career option is dance choreographer, right? Now, if you've ever seen me on a dance floor, you would know that would be a horrible decision for me to make. Really? No, to death. no more career changes? Yeah, no, I think I'm done. I would, and I would starve to death if I was going to be a dance choreographer. However... <laughs> However, if you look at the area of what dance choreography falls into, it falls into coach, teacher, security guard, police officer. That's, the, that's that cluster that they belong in. Well, man, that nailed me perfectly. And so maybe what you, if you take that and you get those top couple, three, four, five, whatever those look like, maybe none of those excite you. But if you looked into that cluster, you might find something that's going to match up really well with your interests and things you like to do. Uh, a lot of people I know... Uh, some of them will, will get some of those interesting jobs mm-hmm. as their number one. I never had that. I never had that issue. From the moment uh, I, I turned eight in third grade, I wanted to be a criminal justice attorney. I, I take the Zello course. Number one option. Number two is just all the things that would be associated with that. And so a lot of, a lot of people, you know, the program sometimes is, is boring when you could play on your phone. But instead, I, I, I looked at it. I was like, oh, okay, so it's at least somewhat accurate. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I say play on our phones. Played on you our phones. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so you still want to be a criminal justice lawyer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, though. I'm getting a pretty severe case of senioritis this year. Sure, sure. So I, I've been looking at other things that 
<laughs> may may require a little bit less schooling, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's still definitely probably my number one. Got gotcha. Number one right well, now. Well, I can tell you, obviously, having been in law enforcement and done a career in that, I spent a lot of time with criminal defense lawyers. Oh, uh, you probably don't like them. Too no, much. no, I like them. They're really good people. Really good people. I think you know. The, I think the the niche that you find yourself in is when you can separate yourself from the job, and quite frankly, that's life. Yeah. Um, if you can, if you get yourself in a position where your identity is your job. I think, in my opinion, that's a miserable existence. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I really think you've got to be able to maintain yourself separate from what you do. I mean, I think it's going to, there's going to be some crossover. I think that exists especially uh, in high school mm-hmm. is trying to separate yourself from what you do necessarily. A lot of people – I mean, it's, it's the clicks, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people will, will do football, for example, and think they're a football player and that's it. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's actually – most people don't know that in debate is a very big issue. Mm-hmm. Debate kids are debate kids, and then they kind of get mind uh, that, that single mind. And that's kind of how I used to think. But um, being able to separate yourself from what you do and kind of find out who you are, mm-hmm. uh, you can't get so caught up in, in one thing. Uh, so you mentioned being in choir. And so if you'll think about when I went through high school, and this would have been in the 80s, um, so I was a three-sport athlete, but I was also in both the select choir and, and the tryout choir, and then I did all the musicals. So I was kind of that guy that was all over the place, yeah. and, and I didn't fit into it like, oh, he's a jock, or he's a this or that. And so what I found interesting was when I got into education, um, other teachers, I found, would actually stereotype me based on, because at that time I was coaching at the college, and then I was teaching, and they would find out I was a coach, and they kind of yeah, they kind of put me in a corner. Um, in fact, I remember a teacher because I taught IB. If you're international baccalaureate, uh, which is a really tough curriculum, if you graduate with an IB on your high school diploma, you you get automatic acceptance into any Ivy League school. So it's kind of a big deal. And one of the teachers in that grouping, um, she made a comment about me when I put my whistle on. It was a brain eraser. Oh yeah, right? and yeah. Um, and so that was her opinion of me was because I was a coach I couldn't be intelligent right and of course here I am an IB math teacher but I'm obviously not very intelligent because I coach yeah and yeah. so um, yeah I think that's the fun part I think of life is bucking those stereotypes and proving people wrong I think yeah and I, and I couldn't agree more I mean you know I I'm everything our school offers I yeah. I'm a part of just about everything mm-hmm. um, some kids try to escape me and then I join their activity just for the heck of it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and that's, that's one of the, I think so far the, the cool things, uh, you know, about you is you have a lot of different hats that, uh, whether it be ban or old law enforcement or making mobile homes. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, kind of doing it all, some of those, you know, unique perspectives that you kind of bring in, um, do some of them help translate into, uh, being the superintendent here and, and trying to push, the, as you state, steer the, the district and, and directions. I think it gives me some credibility with some parents because I think there, I mean, I think there's a segment of any school population that is anti-education just because of maybe that parent's background. Maybe they had a bad experience in school or maybe they didn't finish school. And so they're in their mind, they've kind of made school a bad thing, kind of a deal. And so to be able to sit down at a table and talk with them about, I mean, dude, I was, I, I made $6 an hour and I had yeah. a wife and a kid, right? I mean, I've been there, you know? Um, and so, um, I've, I've been there where, you know, you're not sure if you can make ends meet or you got to make a decision on whether or not you're going to get car insurance on the car. Or you're going to buy groceries this week, kind of a thing, you know, I've been there. And then I, I've gone through different steps and stages of my life. And so I can sit down with someone and I think I, I can find common ground with almost anybody to have a conversation. And I think that kind of helps disarm them a little bit about the fact that maybe, maybe education isn't all bad. And maybe all educators aren't all bad people trying to put you in compartments. Um, And I think that's really the thing that we've really got to change as a system. And I'm I'm, I'm just talking about education as a whole, whether that be statewide or or nationwide, is is getting ourselves removed from that. Now, you know, you see a lot of it on social media about, you know, winter school is going to champion, you know, the trades or blah. That's been happening for a long time. It truly has. It's been happening a long time. The difference, however, is the conversations people have about them, and that's not something that we as educators control. But if we can show people that we have an understanding of that, and again, going back to the question, because I come from that background, you know, my dad was a union carpenter, and so I would go and help him on jobs and stuff. I've been there and done that part of it. Um, 
it gives me, I think, credibility with those people. So that when I do talk with them about, this could be good for your son to look into this trade school. I know you're against school and you want him to just go get a job when he graduates, but this could be really good for him. Because the difference might be him, and I, I hate to use this example, but it's kind of the one everybody uses. He could go flip burgers at McDonald's for 12 bucks, or they'll guarantee him 15 bucks at Spangles or whatever, but they're only giving him 20 hours. Yeah. Or he could put a little bit of time in and pick up this certification, and he's guaranteed to start anywhere at at least 22 an hour. Yeah. All of a sudden, that's a, that's a game changer conversation for a life. Um, and you, you know, I've, I've brought it up and you've talked about it, uh, about steering the direction, uh, steering the district into um, direction. What, what direction do you think our district um, should be going? Like, what, what are some new things you'd like to see? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think um, that's a great flat-footed question to hit me with. I think, um, really, I think we're, we're already moving in that direction. And that is, you know, we've, we've really changed the focus in terms of we've got great teachers in our district. Um, and we've got some antiquated uh, curriculum, so we're in the in the in the role of trying to get that curriculum updated. Uh, we just passed a bond. We're trying to get some facility upgrades done um, that that will help us in that. And then and then again, just what we're doing with the Zello and the upgrades we've done in our shop area here at the high school, et cetera. The science department, what we've done there, um, trying to kind of put our eggs in those baskets yeah. in terms of the areas that are going to help because I'm telling you right now, the hot commodities out there in the world, if you're looking for, if you are investing in careers, I'm telling you right now, it's STEM, you know, um, it's the medical field and it is, it is some trades, not all the trades, yeah. but some trades, right? And know that in STEM, I'm throwing in there both informational, so tech, you know, tech security, that kind of stuff, which is a huge, huge market right now, but also that medical component yeah. of that, the information uh, wave behind it, behind uh, that. I know uh, my wife was a medical scribe for a while, and basically their job behind the scenes is they transcribe every conversation you have with your doctor. They transcribe all of this. That's all being done remotely. Yeah. And so that's a piece of that, that tech trade piece. And so those are the hot three. And so as I think about our district, as we're trying to move in those directions, those are things we've really bolstered our IT department in terms of what we do with infrastructure. Look at the equipment you've got in this room, for yeah. example, right? What we've done in the science uh, wing here this past summer and what we've done and currently doing down in the in the metal shop, yeah. wood shop down there with upgrading the equipment, upgrading the facilities, et cetera. Um, those are all pieces of this. And then finally, just... Um, the investment we're making in staff in terms of increasing their ability to teach and teach uh, differently uh, because as brain research comes out, we're learning that the youth learn a lot different today than they were learning 10 years ago because of the um, because of technology. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think back to when I was in school and you probably heard this before, but I remember in my, I have a philosophy on education about learning just in time, learning just in case. OK, so learning just in case would be, for example, when my math teacher told me, you have to memorize the multiplication table because you might not have a calculator handy, right? Yeah. So I was learning just in case I didn't have a calculator handy. Well, now with the advent of iPhones, yeah. I mean, you're never not without a calculator, right? So that just in case versus just in time. And the best example I could give you of just in time is, um, let's say, for example, uh, when I get home tonight and I throw a load of clothes in the dryer, my dryer doesn't heat up. Well, I'm going to get on YouTube and I'm going to, I'm going to, or I'm going to Google, uh, my dryer's not heating up and I'm going to put in the, the make and model of my, my dryer. And there will be a thousand videos on YouTube on what might be the reason or how to troubleshoot my dryer. And then once I figure that out, I can Google how to change the heating element in a dryer and I'm going to get another 10,000 videos on how to do that. Now, would I look that up today right now? No, why would I? But when my dryer quits working, I need to learn that just in time. Yeah. Right. And so helping students understand what they have available to them and where to go get that information, what resources are available to them so that they can be successful. And they're not stuck waiting two weeks for the dryer repairman to come look at their dryer when they could do a quick Google run out to get on Amazon, order the part, and have it delivered on their porch the next morning and they could have their dryer running tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, and then some, you know, a question on the how the changing and, and our curriculum and whatnot. Um, our school doesn't offer uh, honors courses and, and, and AP classes. Right. Are, those, are those changes that uh, might be looked into in the future? Yeah, the problem is as you start adding sections, um, you're limited by 
staff, uh, you're limited by, by curriculum offering, et cetera. And so um, know that like with AP courses, uh, teachers have to go get a special certification yeah. to teach an AP course. So not just any teacher can teach AP. And so that becomes a thing where we run into, we need a staff member that's interested in it and there has to be a uh, demand for it yeah right and so occasionally you guys and i think you've just completed one um you guys are going to do surveys where you're completing a survey based on what are the things you'd like to see offered at the high school and what activities would you like to see offered that aren't currently offered in a lot of, and when when a lot of people look at that they think oh they're talking about soccer or they're talking about ffa yeah. or they're talking about but we're talking about you know if we had 10 students that wanted to take AP government, that ends up being a demand that we need to try to fill. Um, but we just don't have that kind of demand right now. And so the cost to get someone, first of all, find someone that wants to do it. Yeah. Pay them to get it done. And then once they get it done, open up the section. And if nobody takes the class, it ends up being a waste of money. Yeah. Right? A waste of resources. And so really it comes down to supply and demand. Yeah. Um, and then another thing that, that you brought up, cell phones. Yeah. Now, I know you didn't make this decision, but our schools no longer allow cell phones in the classroom. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are your thoughts on, on the cell phone policy? So I'm kind of torn on that. Um, interesting side note, though, right now there's currently a bill entered in, in Topeka, and they're going to be voting on it later this summer, that would make cell phones illegal in schools. So they're yeah. actually going to add a criminal element to being in possession of your cell phone in school, right? That's actually a bill that's been proposed. Whether it'll pass or not, I don't know. But it's yeah. literally out there, right? And I think it's on the Senate side. I think the Senate, you see, you might want to look into that. But anyway, um, which I think that, that seems that's crazy to me. And, here, and here's what yeah. I would say about that. So, um, and I say I'm torn on it. Number one, having been a classroom teacher, having been a building administrator, I spent a lot of time policing phones. Yeah. Because quite frankly, a 13, 14, 15-year-old kid does not have the self-control to leave it alone. Right. Even if we do the pockets, even if we tell you if it goes off, you know, then we're going to be battling you for you didn't put your phone in the pocket. Where's your phone at? Blah, blah, blah. You know, when we should be focusing on instruction, we're, we're arguing over yeah. this silly phone. Right. And then we've got um, the kids that comply. Right. And there's always the argument. Well, if I don't have my phone, then if we, if we had a, a tragedy, I, I wouldn't be able to yeah. call 911, et cetera. You know, and I, and I get that. Um, but I, I'm when I say I'm torn, I'm torn because how do we teach? Um, you know, informational uh, citizenship. H how do we teach that self-discipline? How do we teach that self-control where you can have that phone in your pocket? It could be going yeah. off and you're not going to reach for it, right? While we've been sitting here and you've been recording me, my phone's gone off three times, okay? You don't know it. I didn't grab for it. I didn't reach for it, okay? Um, but that takes a measure of self-control that a 50-year-old guy can has maybe yeah, but, but maybe a 15 year old kid doesn't right and my thought was i mean i i'd be a liar if i sat here and said that i think phones are only beneficial in schools and that right. i trust all of the students mm -hmm. out here to to use them responsibly but then there's the part of me that wants my phone right <laughs> you know, but absolutely um, you know my thought process process on it is there's always going to be kids who are distracted easily and and will use their phone as an outlet to not pay attention to the classroom right um, but then my other thought process is, you know, this is the information era that we're living in, right? Everything is at the, you know, tips of our fingers. Our phones are, are interconnected with us. They're, a, they're essentially a part of us now. I mean, they're part of our identity online and then they're part of how, you know, they're part of our brains in, in terms of getting information. Mm -hmm. Um, my thought was always, it's interesting to teach kids to live in that world but then now in the classroom, we don't have that with us. Right. So it's uh, – I, I obviously see the, the, the fact – I mean, I've been told to put my phone away. I, I'm, and I'm not even a big phone person. But um, there, there's always the – I'm also split on it of, you know, we live in a world where phones are always available to us. But in the classroom, we no longer have them. And it's, sometimes it's interesting to see uh, the benefits and, and um, the negatives to it. Sure. Um, well, I can tell you, I ha I'll have I'll have a meeting with with an adult professional, and during the conversation, they're doing this, you know, because they're getting their text messages on their watch. Yeah. They may not be reaching for their phone, but they're doing the same thing. The disengaging is right? yeah. yeah. And so when that happens, I just stop talking until they're done, you know, and then they notice I've stopped. Oh, I I, I was listening, and yeah, 
you know, yeah. I want to make sure we've got, you know, we're connected here while we're doing this. So that's why I say I'm, I'm, I'm torn on it because I understand why the policy is needed. Because, again, as a building principal, I spent a lion's share of my time managing that. Yeah. And it was a pain, right? And we have a lot of students that they don't have the academic acumen that they should be disjointed from what's going on yeah. in the classroom. They need to be focused. And if that's what we have to do to get that done, that's fine. But to your point, where else are they not going to have it available, yeah. Yeah. right? And I will tell you, if you've gone anywhere, um, you know, go into any store or anywhere else, how many times do you see a worker on their phone when they should be helping you or helping a customer, right? Yeah. And so they didn't learn that. And are we going to teach it to them if they don't have access to it? Probably not. But are we going to teach them anything if they do? That becomes yeah. the, <laughs> that becomes the toss up. Um, and then some other changes that have been talked about recently is some are uh, some are arguing for a four day school schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, what is some of the thought process on on that even becoming an idea? Sure. So um, that is something that we've been looking into uh, the four day school week and and. Uh, you know, really, there's the research out there goes, it's 50-50. Yeah, yeah. There's some research that says it's really bad for kids. There's other research that says there's absolutely no negative to it. Um, there's some research out there that shows there's a there's kind of a bell curve or a point of diminishing return where you spend so much time in the classroom and it's just an uphill curve in terms of academic uh, ability, but you're going to reach a point when you it's saturation. You hit too yeah. much and you start to decline. And that sweet spot usually falls around the beginning of the fifth day. So the argument is, so would we get more out of a four-day week than we were to five-day? And could we as educators control ourselves well enough? And could the students keep themselves focused long enough that we could get a, get enough done in four days to make it a viable option? The real, the real advantages to it, quite frankly, is pretty simple. And that is a recruiting opportunity for us to recruit and retain great teachers and students, yeah. okay, because one of the things that's going to happen in Topeka, unless they do something, unless they change something, July one becomes the open enrollment yep. law, and so what that means is, you know, I could I'm living in South Hutch, and if I want to send my kid to Andale, yeah, you, if I can get my kid there, Andale's got to take my kid, yeah, as long as they've got a seat available, right, and so the concern is when that happens. All the schools are literally going to be competing with each other for the same teachers and the same yeah. students. Which is uh, something that I've given a lot of thought on um, because some school, private schools kind of already do that with mm-hmm. public schools, except it's not, a, uh, it's not a fair fight with public schools and private schools because of the districts and pool of students. Right. Um, trying to make our school look as appealing as possible. Um, and, and there's obviously there's a lot of pluses and minuses to four school, but one of the things that come to my mind first is – uh, and you kind of mentioned it with, uh, you know, educators being able to to help control some of that is, would that fifth day become a, another day of school or would it be, at, would it actually be a free day for <laughs> students to do, um, you know, what they want to do? Sure. So our, our plan as we put it together right now, um, and again, we're just spitballing right now, is that literally school would be four days a week. The fifth day, you wouldn't come to school. Now, if you're involved in an activity or a sport, yeah. you might still have a practice. You might still have a rehearsal. You might still have a competition that you're going to be yeah. expected to be involved in. But in terms of going to school that day, you would not be required to go. The same for staff. Um, we would, However, we would shift all of those professional development days and in-service days to that fifth day. Yeah. And so let's say, for example, the third – let's say we were flexing Mondays. And what that means is that – Tuesday through Friday, we have classes, and then every Monday's off. But every third Monday, teachers would still report to the building for a professional development or in-service, um, but students would not. All right. So. Um, yeah, and so, you know, obviously, uh, it won't affect me either right. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my last uh, couple of months here in, uh, in the district, but um, still, uh, it would be a pretty big change. We'd be one of the... One the first in our area, but not the first in Kansas, of course. No, there are there are like sixty. There are sixty some districts in it's Kansas that are currently four. Relatively popular, a lot of amongst a lot of smaller schools. Yeah, um, and then we, Bonner Springs, Kansas, is the largest district in Kansas that's currently doing it. We would we if we did make that change, are we would we be the larger? Yeah. No, um, and then you know talking about recruiting, that's you're in an interesting district because of the South Hutch. Um, 
the whole city of South Hutch. It, um, that's where I live. A lot of, I mean, I think South Hutch Elementary is our largest mm-hmm. school yeah. uh, in terms of population, um, which, you know, for some, it's kind of weird to have an elementary school be your largest in comparison to certain districts. But a lot of kids end up going to USC 308 because right. the middle schools are, it's closer. I right. mean, it's, it's an easier drive to get to Hutch High than it is to Nickerson High School. Right. Um, and so, you know, we talk about recruiting. We already kind of have that that interaction with with Hutch. Do you think it would kind of help retain some of the it potentially the students could. In South it, Hutch? it literally could. I mean, so I think uh, the question was about retaining students, like for example, South Hutch from going to Hutch. Yeah, and I think, um, and that again, when I said recruit and retain students, that's what I meant by that. Some families. Um, they do weigh pretty heavily on what the student wants in terms of that. And so, yeah. um, you know, we've got a lot of families that live in South Hutch that their students go to Haven. Yeah. We've got some that go to Hutch. We've got some that go to Bueller. And, and I, vice versa. And I made that decision myself when I was uh, um, in sixth grade, actually, yeah. uh, if I would go to Reno Valley Middle School or if I would go to um, HMS 7. Mm-hmm. And my decision came down to I wanted to do, I wanted to do band and weights mm-hmm. and the year before I got into H, H- or, sorry, RVMS, you couldn't do band and weights because mm. of the, the class changes. So, you know, some of those smallest, my, mine literally came up to is what is my seventh hour going to be? Um, and so, you know, this is a little bit different than changing, you know, our, uh, you know, if we're going to be able to do both of those. Um, so I would imagine it would have a pretty large impact on the number of students who would yeah. want to go here. So now go back to your sixth grade self and your choice is, do you go to Hutch and go to school for five days a week or do you go to Nickerson and go for four days a week? Yeah. And you get three day weekends every weekend, right? And so there are some families that absolutely wouldn't put up with that. And there are a lot of families from what we're understanding that would be pretty excited about that opportunity. And I can't imagine there's not a lot of students that wouldn't be excited about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you tell a kid, do they want to go to school four days or five days? They're going to choose yeah. four days uh, nine times out of ten. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the questions, though, that I would have about four days is um, during school, time is always a factor. Uh, having class time to do certain things. I think of things like band, choir, uh, debate and forensics even, where our practice time is in class would that fifth day be an option for the extracurriculars to host new practices that like i mean nor uh, that normally wouldn't be seen well i think that it's the same as basketball or football or anything else they're going to continue to practice five days a week and so i think i don't know what that model would look like but, but i can tell you that clearly you know that would be an option but that would be something i think that would have to be worked out between that activity sponsor and those families because again that activity sponsor is a teacher yeah yeah. And um, while the rest of their colleagues are working four days a week, they'd be working five. Yeah. Right? And so the question becomes, can you get the same amount of work done in that same time period? And, I, you know, I say that tongue in cheek when um, you think about some of your classes. Um, if you go into class and you've got the first five or ten minutes to check email before class begins, and then yeah. maybe the last 10 or 15 they give you to work on your assignment, we'll add that up over the course of the year. Yeah. How many days do you think you just gave away? Some... Uh you know, I've, I've actually talked to some administrators from other schools before, and they just bell-to-bell teaching mm-hmm. is uh, what a lot of schools preach. Um, is that something that would, they, would kind of be the... They say that. Yeah, but, but how often yeah, is it actually? Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, unless I have kids in this district, probably won't affect me too much, but also a lot of interesting changes. You yeah. know, I've been in the district since third grade, mm-hmm. uh, uh, seen... Quite a bit of change, but we're in the we're in a very interesting point in mm-hmm. terms of education. You know, COVID just ended, and and COVID kind of brought to light a lot of the a lot of the issues that school systems see. And so you you're placed in an interesting position in an interesting district to where, uh, what changes are we going to make, and what changes are we not going to make? Well, you have to think a lot of schools have looked at this, and you know, I mean, in our in our situation, after COVID, whether that was families moving away or homeschooling or whatever, you know, we've lost, you know, 50, 60 kids yeah, since we COVID. went from 4A to now 3A school. And, you know, that plays a role. Uh, it plays a role quite a bit, actually. And, and, and some of the things we do, I became more I, I became more aware of the differences. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, another thing is uh, if you look at some other 4A schools, they're <clears throat> They're very different from, from Nickerson. Uh, I go to schools every Saturday, it seems like, for, for tournaments and whatnot. And uh, just recently I went to Tonganoxie, um, and they have a brand-new school. Um, 
like a whole like a whole new facilities and whatnot. Um, and we recently passed the uh, the the bond for that will add a few more changes into the district is um, more, you know, obviously this is a, a big question for the future. Um, are more bond type changes going to be um, a part of the future? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, the reality becomes it's a matter of what the community will support. Um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, our, our community um, isn't a very affluent one. And so when you think about that, um, and you think about the fact we just passed a, a $7.6 million bond, and it only passed by 80 votes. Yeah, and it's $7.6 million. The original bond was upwards of 30. Right. Um, so and big, that was crushed. Yeah, yeah, big, big changes. And when you consider... Um, to build a new building, yeah. if you wanted to, if we were going to build a a seven twelve center with all athletic facilities, you know, because I've heard that conversation before, and we were going to build that in South Edge, and you know, if that was going to happen, well, you're you're talking a a fifty sixty million dollar project, and so if we got a, an eight million dollar one passed by eighty votes, and a thirty four million dollar bond got crushed eighty twenty, what are the chances of passing that? You and then know, I have a question, and I probably should be more aware of it. What is our, our school board made up of, like, um, in terms of who, where their seats come from? Gotcha. So it's divided up. Um, so we have um, seats that come from South Hutch. We have sa- seats that come from Reno Valley, and we have seats that come from Nickerson. Um, and then we've got an at-large seat that can be anywhere, right? And so I think the founding fathers, if you will, back in the day, thought that through. And so when they built the board, they made sure that it wasn't a, a South Hutch board that would say, hey, we're moving the school, yeah, you know, yeah. or it's a Nickerson board. Hey, we're moving all the South Hutch kids to Nickerson, you know. Um, they, they made sure there was a good mix on the board that would prevent there being a majority that could do something like that. Yeah, and, um, you know, obviously I'm always going to be biased because I have to drive to Nickerson every morning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, gas isn't exactly cheap right now, but, um, you know, South Hutch is a – is much larger than, mm-hmm. than Nickerson by like 2,000 people. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, where our school, and obviously we go back to the, the foundation of it. Things, yeah. things are much different from 1912, I think, is when our school, uh, Nickerson uh, Community College became Nickerson mm-hmm. Rural High School. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, big picture decisions like that are um, – Always, they're always in my mind, obviously. Uh, um, it's always going to, you know, it's one of those things, no matter what you're looking at historically, it's always important to follow the money. Yeah. Okay. So when you think back to when most of our buildings were built in the 50s, so you've got to go back to the 50s and look at what the population looked like in the 50s. Nickerson yeah. was a, a large growing community at that time. So the idea of having the high school and an elementary school in this made total sense. Yeah. There are also additional elementary schools in the district as well. Um, and South Hutch was just kind of a fledgling little community. Well, you just don't know over time. You know, the railroad pulls out of Nickerson. There goes jobs. There yeah. goes people, right? Um, and so then that growth starts to stymie. And those people have to make a decision. They're either going to go into Hutch or they're going to go to Sterling or they're going to go to Lyons. You know, um, meanwhile, South Hutch is sitting there on the outskirts of Hutch. And people that decide they don't want to live in Hutch anymore, but they want to they yeah. work there or whatever, living in South Hutch makes sense. And then it just kept growing. And um, like I said earlier, uh, the elementary school is the largest building in district and getting larger now mm-hmm. when in terms of uh, the size of the school itself uh, with the bond part of it going towards uh, building new classrooms for South Hutch. Um, some of the members of the Nickerson community talking about, you know, ele- the elementary school here in, in Nickerson as well are changes being made to to that elementary school. Is it focusing just on the South Hutch one right now? Every building is being touched, um, but there are no additional classrooms being added to any building but South Hutch. But, uh, yeah. And the main reason that for that is because of South Hutch, if you know, behind the building, we've got modulars back yes, there. Yeah. And that was never meant to be permanent. That was temporary. Yeah. And so that's the point is that that permanent yeah. is building these classrooms to get those students out of the modulars and into the main part of the building. But every other building's being, you know, new windows, new door fronts, better secured access, better security, the auditorium here at the high Which school. Which is my favorite change. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I've, I've done every musical here in the mm-hmm. past four years. Um, 
sprained my ankle by catching my foot in a rope because there was oh, too many people yeah, backstage. Yeah. Um, that's that's obviously my favorite stage. And not to mention, I mean, our our seats don't have handicap seats uh, available, so it's always an awkward one. So yeah, and you know. so unfortunately, you know, our original plan had been to blow out the back and blow out the sides of the auditorium to give us a good backstage and to give us enough stage we could put the band on the stage, yeah. et cetera. But just those changes alone, we would have spent the entire $8 million just on the auditorium. So instead, what we're having to do is keep the footprint, and then it's just going to be state-of-the-art. It's going to be the best seating, the best lighting, the best sound you can get is what we're really focused on. Of course, the changes happen after I'm well, gone. Yeah. But <laughs> Maybe there was yeah. that on purpose, you know? I heard you sing at the musical. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, not everyone would disagree with you there, but... Uh, um, you know, I, I started out asking about, you know, what makes you special and and obviously the I think I think it's pretty you said you said you didn't know at first. But, um, you know, the amount of hats that you that you wear, the amount of things that you do and the perspectives that you can bring. And obviously we talk about how you can use that to you know connect with people who uh, who most people, you know, or not most, but a lot of people wouldn't be able to connect with Um and then, you know, as a superintendent, you're kind of, you know, you're seen as, you know, the top, you know, the top guy in, in, in the district. And um, that already causes some disconnect there, like that you, you mentioned on. And so um, you're able to kind of bridge that more than some superintendents because, you know, it's easier to talk to, say, a musician than the guy who's in charge of everything you do. Yeah, sure. Um, and so, uh, you know, those, those interesting perspectives, I think, is probably, you know, what makes you as a person and then as a superintendent um, special and we obviously talk a lot about you know f- ideas about the district and future and whatnot and so I think I uh, thank you for the conversation I yeah. think it was a, a an interesting one talking about you know USD 309 uh, been here since third grade uh, went through every building except Nickerson Elementary and um, you know obviously even though I won't be here next year still love the district and uh, thank it for a lot of the the stuff that um, it's provided and even even though I won't be be looking at it, if if four days do change, I will regret coming here when there was five. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe but, we'll uh, name the fifth day after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day, call yeah. it call it the you know uh, sp- the the Spurlock day or the something Spurlock like that. Day, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but uh, you know, thank you for having this conversation, and thank you all for listening.